Hi everybody, and welcome to this supplemental video on Wireshark. Wireshark's a piece of software that allows you to capture packets going into and out of your computer as you're running applications. They actually let you see protocols in action. Students have told us over the years that Wireshark is an incredibly valuable hands-on learning tool, and we think you'll find it that way too. So we've created this supplemental video to help you get started with Wireshark. Okay, so here's what we're going to do. We're going to start off with a review of layering and encapsulation, because when we look at captured frames, link layer frames in Wireshark, we'll see that all of the protocols that sit above that are encapsulated. So that's a good review. With that foundation, we're then going to talk about the structure of Wireshark, how it interacts with your operating system, how packets are captured. Then we're going to take Wireshark out for a test run. We'll capture some packets during an interaction with a web server. Then we'll open up Wireshark's display and we'll take a look at the packets that are captured. Finally, we'll end up with a quick discussion of, well, if it doesn't seem to be working right, what might be going wrong with the way you've configured Wireshark or your computer? I hope you'll enjoy this supplemental video. Okay, before getting started with Wireshark, it'll be good for us to take, make a quick review of layering and encapsulation because Wireshark's going to capture packets, capture frames at the link layer. And as we've learned in chapter one, the link layer frames will contain a network layer datagram, which will contain a transport layer segment, which will contain an application layer message. So it's good for us to have a good foundation in layering and encapsulation. So let's start at the top. Application instances are going to exchange messages with each other. In the case of HTTP, they're going to exchange HTTP messages, which will be transported using the TCP transport protocol. The TCP transport protocol is going to take this application layer message, say an HTTP message, and it's going to add a transport layer header to it, HT here, to create a transport layer segment. That transport layer segment is going to then be handed down to the network layer. The network layer is going to add its own header, H of N, shown here, to the transport layer segment to create the network layer datagram. Then at the link layer, the link layer is going to take that network layer datagram, add its own link layer header, H sub L, to it, take the network layer datagram, use that as the payload to create a link layer frame. And it's these link layer frames that are going to be captured by Wireshark. Okay, having reviewed layering and encapsulation, now let's see how Wireshark looks. Let's take a look at the basic structure. Okay, to understand Wireshark structure and how it integrates with the operating system and your network interface, Let's focus on the device where you're actually capturing these packets. We see here the packets flowing into and out of uh, whichever device it is that you're capturing packets on. Let's take a closer look. We can see here the protocol stack that we've seen before, the application, for instance, a web browser running up in user space, the transport network and link layers running inside the operating system, and again, with packets flowing to and from the link layer interface. Now let's see where Wireshark itself actually fits in. We can see here that what Wireshark is doing is essentially tapping into the link layer within the protocol stack. It's receiving a copy of all frames that are sent and received over the link layer interface. A copy of these frames is stored in a packet capture or a PCAP file. When we start and stop packet capture in Wireshark, that will cause Wireshark to create this PCAP file. In addition to the PCAP file, the part of Wireshark that you'll actually be using the most is the packet analyzer that's sitting on top. The packet analyzer will give us a visual interface to investigate the frames that are stored within this captured PCAP file. Now that we've got a basic idea of how Wireshark looks, time to take it out for a test run. Well, before we actually fire up Wireshark, let's take a look at the screen we're going to see when we actually start Wireshark up. 
screen shown here. The most important part is probably down in the bottom, bottom half of the screen here, where we have a list of the link layer interfaces on which frames can be captured on your computer. As you can see here, we're going to be capturing on the Wi-Fi EN0 interface. That's probably the one you're going to want to use because most laptops connect to the internet wirelessly. Up in the top half, we have recent PCAP files that I've actually opened here. This is not going to be as important to you right now when you're capturing packets live, but maybe for a homework assignment or something like that, you may need to actually open a PCAP file. So you can see recently opened PCAP files there. Perhaps the most important two buttons here are in the top left-hand corner, the blue Wireshark fin, which is what you'll press in order to actually begin capturing packets, and then the red stop button just to the right of that. Well, once we stop packet capture or when we open a file, this is the Wireshark screen that we're going to see. This is the screen that allows us to analyze the contents of a PCAP file. And here are the various components that are shown on this screen. At the very top, we see the command menus. So there's a menu, menu bar across the very top, and then there are the menu icons. We can already see the Wireshark fin as well as the stop button there. Maybe the most important component of the Wireshark screen is the listing of captured packets, as we can see here. This is a window into the series of packets that have been captured in this particular window here, it's showing us packets 55 through 66 that have been captured here. Right below that, we have the details of a selected packet. We've selected packet 57 in the listing of captured packets window above, and here we have the details of packet number 57. We see that it's an Ethernet packet, it's an IPv4 packet, and actually if we scroll down, there'll be additional information down there below. And if you really, really want to geek out, you can actually see those con uh, the contents of that packet in hexadecimal or ASCII. We can resize these windows. When I use uh, Wireshark, typically I'll make this packet content in hexadecimal and ASCII relatively small because I spend most of my time looking at the details of a selected packet or looking at this listing of captured packets above. And then finally, we'll come back to this a little bit later, there's a display filter specification, which is useful, but again, we'll come back to that shortly. Okay, if you're gonna use Wireshark, you've gotta first install it on your computer, and so you wanna to go to www.wireshark.org and download the appropriate version for the computer you're going to be running it on. And I wanna say, it's a really, really popular tool. And with 400,000 downloads a month, if you've got questions, you're having problems, if you learn how to search, you ask ChatGPT, my experience has been you can almost always find answers for any questions that you might have. Okay, one last thing that we need to do before we actually start up Wireshark, and that is we need to make sure that the packets that are going to be captured by Wireshark are not encrypted. So that means a couple of things. You should not be using a VPN. You should not capture packets, HTTP messages, for example, uh, when you're going to URLs that begin with HTTPS, because that's going to imply encryption of messages. You want to turn off any browser or operating system privacy settings. Those are good things turn them back on later, but that's often a source of problems that students have encountered. You wanna also make sure that you're not using HTTP3 or Quick. These are becoming browser defaults very quickly, and they will, by default, encrypt the packets. And so, you know, you're capturing packets, you'll be able to capture packets, but you won't be able to look inside them because they'll be encrypted. So the message is no VPNs, um, URLs going that begin with HTTPS are going to have encryption. You don't want browser and operating system privacy turned on, turn it off for the time being while you're capturing. And if you're using HTTP3, well, you don't want to be using HTTP3. Here's a URL down here below that will tell you how to disable Quick and HTTP3 as the default in some popular uh, web browsers. Okay, and with that, we're ready to go. Okay, so why don't we get started? Let me start up Wireshark down here. 
water shark starting. Let me make the screen a little bit bigger here. And actually, let's make it full screen. Okay, we can see the wireless interface, my Wi-Fi interface down there, and you can see some squiggling lines. It's capturing packets. Oh, okay. I've started it up. I've started up Wireshark by clicking on that interface, and now I see this is the Wireshark interface showing me the packets that it's captured, and it's already captured 370 packets, frames going by at the link layer. All right, so now what I want to do is I want to go visit this URL, gaia.cs.umass.edu, and the Wireless Lab, the intro page. I've just downloaded it. Now, I've been doing all of this on Wireshark, so hopefully that HTTP request I just made will be there. So let me stop. I've just stopped. Stop Wireshark capture. Now I've typed in HTTP into the screen up above. Okay, let's take a look now at that message, that HTTP message that was downloaded as a result of the browser activity that I did. So what I did here is I clicked on the triangle to the left of the phrase Hypertext Transfer Protocol, and that expanded the uh, HTTP message. So now I can see all of the fields in the HTTP message. We'll learn about that in the next chapter, but you can see here there's a get field with the name of the URL that I retrieved, HTTP 1.1, the host, the fact that I'm using uh, Mozilla 5.0 as my browser, and more information. So this link layer packet that was captured, which contains an IP datagram, which contains a TCP segment, which contains the HTTP message, we can peek inside all of those protocol messages using the frame that was captured by Wireshark. We can look inside the TCP segment by clicking on the greater than sign to the left of the TCP transmission control protocol text. We can look inside the IPv4 packet by clicking on the greater than sign to the left of that phrase, and we can look inside the ethernet frames as well. Well, we've been looking at the HTTP GET message, which is actually, what, message number 719 in the panel above. Let's now take a look at the HTTP reply, which is actually message 732. We can go down to the bottom, we can close up the IP, the TCP fields, and we can expand the HTTP message fields. And now look at the content of the HTTP reply message. Well, I hope you found that test run, taking Wireshark out, taking a look, capturing some HTTP messages, and taking a look at them interesting. I want to close out this video by just spending a little bit of time talking about what happens if it seems like Wireshark isn't quite working right. Well, if you're having problems with Wireshark capture, there's a couple of things you can do. First of all, there are millions and millions of Wireshark users, so searching, Asking questions to ChatGPT, my experience is you'll almost always find an answer. Often, a first Wireshark project that students undertake is to capture some HTTP packets and then look at them to see what the format of the HTTP get or reply messages are. And so students can make a capture, but then they look at it and they say, hey, there are no HTTP messages that I can see in this trace. And I know, because I was using my browser, I actually went to a website. Almost always, that's one of four reasons. You're either using a VPN, you've typed in HTTPS as opposed to HTTP, you've got a browser or operating system privacy settings that are encrypting what's going out, or you're using HTTP or QUIC as, as your browser default. And you may not know that. And maybe one last tip I'll pass on, and this is really for the case that you're looking at HTTP messages only, is to always clear out your browser cache and clear out your history before using Wireshark to capture messages. Well, that wraps up this supplemental video on Wireshark. I hope you found it interesting. I can absolutely promise you that you're gonna find Wireshark to be a really invaluable tool to help you learning about computer networks and their protocols.